Um, prayer has been doing some incredible stuff this week with some people. Um, by the way, we're, we're recording my speaking, which is weird, and I have to be careful with giving names out, I guess, so I'm trying to be cautious about that. Um, but uh, Daddy Blake is still here with us, <laughs> so that's been some real good prayers, and um, uh, Marlene's mom, so far, as we know, still needs, still needs a lot of prayer, so, and the family. Um, we're in the book of Revelation. Um, death and destruction comes before life. It's the way of this world, it's the way of salvation through Christ Jesus where his body was destroyed and then di he died. And we serve a Savior who defeated even that death and destruction. And there is a bunch of it in the book of Revelation. And I don't want to, you know, cheat anybody out of the surprise ending of the book of Revelation, but God wins. Everything is, goes well. <laughs> That doesn't mean that we don't have to go through the death and destruction part, which is really, really excruciating. So this is why uh, God decided there should be more than two people on the planet. This is why we have each other together to pray for each other, to pray for one another. Because I'll tell you, there's some weeks that some people just, uh, it's a nightmare for them to get through. And... I believe strongly that our prayers is the thing that gets them through. I believe that very strongly. It's easy when you're in the middle of death and destruction to have your faith questioned brutally to the point where you may not believe. That's hard, but it happens to people. It's nothing to slap them about. It's something to be compassionate about passionate for the person. They're going through a trial unlike anything they've ever been through and it beats up everything they've ever known. Every faction of their life is affected by this event, whether it's somebody who is deathly ill. There's a number of my friends whose wives or husbands are fighting cancer and losing and they are their faith is being stretched almost to the breaking point, and some of them right, right to the break, breaking point and past it. Um, and I get very angry when somebody stands there and saying, well, their faith couldn't have been very strong. That's got nothing to do with it. <laughs> nothing to do with it. There are a boatload, boatloads of Fair weather Christians. Praise Jesus, glory to his name, until something really, really bad happens, and then for the deal is off. Forget it. It's a human reaction, it's a fleshly reaction. It's somewhat blasphemous, true, but absolutely understandable. And your prayers need to be at your mightiest for those people. Because they are your brothers and sisters. If not in the faith, at least they're your brothers and sisters in man, in kind. And they deserve that. What they don't deserve is a bunch of pharisaical judging and nonsense. Well, the person's going through cancer because they used to smoke. Okay, fine. Your point being... So you have an excuse now not to pray for them because they made a mistake? No. no, absolutely not. In fact, double your prayers for them at that point. Double your prayers for them. We have, you know, in our best days, we can be idiots too. In the book of Revelation, there's a bunch of horrible things going on. And... We're in chapter 14. I wonder what people's reactions are going to be like when stuff like this happens. Well, you don't have to wonder because you can see it today. 
our reactions are very much, they're, they're not going to change. They're pretty much the same as they were in Jeremiah's day. There was a lot of denial going on <laughs> about how crucial things are. Um, there's a lot of denial about faith to begin with. It's hard for us as soldiers of the cross to talk about faith to people because a lot of people are just sick to death of it. Let's face it, it's been misrepresented for thousands of years. It's, misrep it's, it's misrepresented now. Believe in Jesus and all your bills will be healed. No. In fact, you'll probably get more. And you know what? There'll be times when you can't pay for the stuff you want, like your cable. And maybe God is telling you, you don't need cable right now. <laughs> you don't need to be on Facebook this week or next week. In fact, I want you off of it. But that's not fair, God. You guys killed my son. Tell me about fair. <laughs> okay? It's not fair. You were born. That sounds pretty fair to me. You've been given life. That's incredibly fair, I think. You breathe. You can see. You can hear. You can walk. Some of you with a little bit of trouble, yeah. Some people can walk, but only through a lot of pain. Some people can't see at all. In regards to things of the faith, in regards to things of Christ, even those who can see incredibly well are very, very blind. And every, every Sunday there are a great multitude of people who come and hear the gospel and haven't heard a single word of it because they believe they should only listen to the words that prove them right. And that is the biggest blasphemy of all because that's where you sit in God's house and you pretend you're God. And you don't even know it. You hate the parts of Scripture that you don't like, that you disagree with. It doesn't seem fair. Revelation is full of that. We're talking about destruction on massive scales. Innocent, innocent people dying by thousands, tens, <coughs> hundreds of thousands. Death and destruction. Where is God in all of that? 9-11-2001, when I watched two buildings fall, people were saying, where is God in all this? And I'm saying, his hands were right around those buildings. As horrible as it was, the Challenger accident. Where was God in that? I still don't know. I still don't know. It was hardly fair. Was there a lesson in it? Apparently. But it had to do with the, how they were building, building the ships, what, what they decided to do. Some people learned a lesson against corporate thinking for one thing. Just because the majority of people say it's a good thing doesn't mean it's a good thing. And if you see something wrong, stand up and point it out. Because Jesus did that a lot. He stood up and pointed things out. No, this is wrong. You are wrong. What you think about my law that I wrote before I was even born here is wrong. This woman you bring before me, who was caught in adultery as if she was the only one who was guilty of anything in this entire process, you want me to say it's okay to kill her with stones. Guess what? You're wrong. But your law says, don't tell me what my law says. I wrote it. I know what it says. I know what it means. You're wrong. As human beings, we have to be prepared to be wrong. When we pray for people we don't like, be prepared to be right. When you can't bring yourself to pray for a person you don't like, guess what? You're wrong. When 
Jesus would let you know. What did Jesus tell us to do with our enemies? Kill them. Well, in the Old Testament, God said, yes, he did. But he said it, not you. <laughs> There's a huge difference. There's a huge difference. Here in chapter 13 of Revelation, we're looking at a bunch of people that are worshiping this guy who's got, who is God's enemy. And they're worshiping him like crazy. Because you know why? Because he's bringing them temporary hope in a time of cataclysm. Now, I don't know exactly how that's happening, but a lot of people are liking this beast. I don't know, maybe he's making sure their cable bills are paid. I don't know. But there's all kinds of struggle, and there seems to be a, a lot of peace here and there until you, I don't know, start pointing your finger at the beast, then he doesn't like that. In chapter 11, verse 8, All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear and hear this, because... If you don't understand it, you're probably going to be wrong. We worship these little green pieces of paper, whether we know that or not. Mm. And it's funny because ironically on the pieces of paper, it says, in God we trust. And we don't. We trust the paper more than we trust God. It's weird. If any man have an ear, let him hear there's all kinds of beasts and all kinds of numbers, and I'm not going to get into that periphery or the cogs, deep cogs of the machinery. We start in chapter 14. I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping, with their harps, through their martial amps. It was great. It was beautiful. And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand who were redeemed from the earth. That's a neat statement. Redeemed from the earth. They were, in a way, kept safe from reality. <laughs> Think of that for just a second. These things that are singing a song, a new song that hadn't been heard before. Who's getting the notes? Who's able to understand what the song is saying? These hundred and four whatever number, these people who God has had and has chosen and are with him, that are standing with the Lamb, they get the song. They understand it. It's a brand new song, but they get it. And the other people are not going to be able to hear it. Or they'll be able to hear it, they just won't, I don't know, like it. They won't be able to sing it. As I stand in front of and with a number of people who don't understand my faith particularly, I'm singing a song that they can't really hear. And as you're in a hospital at a deathbed, and people are crying, and you may be crying too, but your crying is different than theirs. That's a new song. That's one song that you understand and they may not. Some may hear that song that you're singing, the new one, and find it intriguing. And they may ask you about that song. What song is that you're singing? It's beautiful. I don't understand it though. My wife feels like that about a lot of my music. <laughs> <laughs> or used to, she's saying, who on earth is that? 
It's Pat Metheny, I'm sorry. <laughs> that sounds kind of weird. <laughs> what part are you singing? <laughs> what part are you singing? I have a member of one of the bands. I'm humming as I'm setting up my equipment. She says, don't you ever sing the melody. <laughs> Why are you always singing one, singing one of the, the harmonies? She goes, you never ever whistle or sing the melody at all, ever. <laughs> you know, so. I, I say, yeah, it's because I'm strange. <laughs> you know? Well, God gave me this gift of being able to hear music in a different way than a lot of people do. I can't explain it. I just love it. It makes me appreciate all kinds of different kinds of music and just, there's a lot of people that kind of, you're weird. That's weird. This is a new song. I wonder what it's going to sound like. Well, it's going to sound like the voice of Great Thunder. And so obviously, I don't know what kind of amps they're going to use. Maybe none at all, because a number of great voices. My parents had been in Wales. My father sat down as a group of 12 men in Wales stood up. And now Welsh singers historically have this incredibly huge voice. He says, David, I sat in that chair with mom, and these 12 men started singing. They about knocked me through the wall. Just the, just the strength of their voices. There wasn't any microphones. There wasn't any electronics at all. It was an old church in Wales, and bam, they started singing. And I felt like somebody punched me in the chest. It's these kind of voices that are going to be singing this song. It's going to be incredible. They sang, as it were, verse 3, a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 140 and 4,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are they who were not defiled with women, for they, were, they are virgins. These are they who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile. What is guile? Lies. Do we know what guile is? It's, it's in the Bible a lot. Do we know what it, it is? What is it like to, what is it to be guileless? At, at the root of it, it means it, deceitful. Yeah. All right, but there's other things that over the years have been kind of introduced to it as well. It also is like spiteful. Mm. Um, like David was saying, it's uh, just not cool. <laughs> not cool at all. Nasty. There's no nastiness with these guys. There's nothing deceitful about them. They're not trying to make themselves look good doing this. They're not getting paid for it. What's in it for them? They stand with God. They always have. They're not defiled. They've been freed from reality. In their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And do you know who has done that for them? God. They're found without fault. Do you think each one of these are perfect? If, if they're who we think they are, they made plenty of mistakes. And so will we. God and Christ Jesus perfects us. There's very little we can do with it other than to decide to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. <laughs> that means when, every, when something else comes up that sounds really good, but I'm not asking Christ about it, ignore it. Run away from it. Get away from it. I saw, verse 6, another angel 
fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The patience of the saints. Our Sunday school teacher a while ago went through the book of Jeremiah. It was an excruciating number of months. Have you ever read through the book of Jeremiah? No? Who has? It's okay. Shame on you guys for not reading through the book. No, it's, I don't blame you for not reading through Jeremiah. You know why? It's not a fun thing. It's bad news. Every single page almost. <laughs> Except for the parts where God says, there's hope in me. Yes, all this death, death and destruction, but I will save you. I'm going to bring you back. Yes, I'm booting you out of the promised land because you're a bunch of jerks, but I still love you, and I'm going to bring you back. Just not right away. <laughs> well, how long? Are we there yet? No. <laughs> right? We're like a bunch of kids in the back of the car whose patience are infinite. Is infinite, right? Are we there yet? No, we're not. How much longer? Another four hours. Sit down and shut up. Oh, my. We had station wagons. I grew up with station wagons. It was always fun when my dad would get lost. <laughs> we're going to, we're going in uh, New Hampshire. There was a place called Palmer. I remember that vibrantly because at 2 o'clock in the morning, between 2 and 4, we drove around and around. Well, we didn't know we were driving around and around. <laughs> but we saw the same sign three times, now entering Palmer. Now, my father wasn't always a Christian-speaking man. <coughs> that car, it was a brown station wagon, but boy, did he turn up blue pretty quick. <laughs> Especially the third time we saw the sign for Palmer. I don't even want to start trying to say what he said. He was, let's put it this way, he was very chagrined at having to go to the same place three times in the middle of the night with rainy fog. The book of Jeremiah is kind of like that. <laughs> Not a fun way to spend a weekend reading Jeremiah. Why can't we read something nice like, I don't know, the Psalms? How many nice Psalms are there? <laughs> there's a lot of nice ones, but there's a lot of really not nice ones. There's a lot of yelling at God in the Psalms. And at the end of each Psalm, the guy that's yelling at God suddenly goes, No, you know what? I'm stupid at yelling at you. Because I need to praise you. But what's so brilliant about the Psalms is that God has them in his word for us because he understands us and he knows us. 
Do you think during these happenings in Revelations there's going to be a bunch of people going, oh, that's just, you know, God doing his thing. I'm not, I'm not bothered by it at all. <laughs> no! There's people going, what are you doing? What's happening? Is this it? Is this the end times? <coughs> Paul said it's the end times a couple thousand years ago. Yes, it is. Newsflash. Happened already. <laughs> According to this, this is future history. Yeah. And unless you're a big Star Trek fan, maybe that concept's a little hard. Right? Future history. In God's time, this is a done deal. 2,000 years ago, give or take, when his son died, his son said three incredible words. Well, that was another great three. It is finished. Just in Greek, just one word, done. Done. In the Greek, just one word, done. It, it is accomplished, is another um, understanding of what he said. Done. On Facebook, I hear, I read all the time. I'm done with this person. Oh, please, shut up. You're not done with this person. If you were done with this person, either you or that person would be dead. And maybe even then you're not done with them. Hmm, that's an interesting thought. What was it? I remember uh, Rod Serling writing an episode of Night Gallery mm -hmm. where um, this uh, hippie guy went to hell and was made to listen to Lawrence Welk records 24-7. Maybe you're not done with that guy. I'm so done with you. Shut up, you're not. Stop saying that. You know what I'm going to sound when you say that? I'm done with you. Say, I have to uh, dismiss myself for now. <laughs> okay? Okay. The people, you know, with the election and everything, I'm so done with you. You know, real close buddies. Getting into this huge argument. I'm done with you. We're done. Please. Good thing both of them don't live in the same nation or anything. <laughs> Goodness. Third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. There are a number of theological points that I can bring up regarding these cups. I won't. I just would like to point out, during the last meal with his disciples, Jesus went through a number of cups of wine. He had to drink a couple himself, and when he was praying in the garden, he asked his father, God, if there was one particular cup he could not drink out of, if it was God's will. But he understood he was going to have to, anyhow, for us. Remember that next time you want to be done with somebody. <laughs> what if Jesus, during praying, said, you know what, I'm done with these people. They're ridiculous. They're full of guile. They're adulterers to my father. They don't do anything. They don't understand anything. What if he finally, what if he said, you know what, I'm done. Thank the good Lord he did not. And he did drink of that hateful cup. Verse 11, again, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, whoever this is. Because we don't know. There's a lot of people that are pointing fingers and saying, it's this person or that person or this person or that person. It isn't. Not yet. Worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Could be Mickey Mouse for all I know. 
Disney. Don't worship Disney. <laughs> Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that, kept, that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Despite everything else, here is the patience of the saints. Despite when you're building your ark in the driveway, what your neighbors are saying about you. Despite what your boss says about you at work. Despite what your friends say when you make a decision that's pro-Christ and anti-you. Despite people saying your faith is not based in science and not based in reality. It doesn't mean that gives you license to act like an idiot. It means that you should be getting a heart more of compassion for these people that don't understand the song you're singing. Because it's a new song and they don't get it. You ever watch a child try to learn how to do something? Our granddaughter, baking cookies. You know how many mistakes I've had to eat? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> You're still alive. You're still alive. <laughs> and it was, deli it was delicious. That required no patience whatsoever, actually. <laughs> That's a bad analogy. Yeah. A bad illustration. Well, there'll be another one. Watching, watching your daughter go through her first heartbreak. Watching your son lose his job because he's late all the time. Where's your patience there? Watching and feeling one you love turn the knife in you. Where's your patience there? Hmm? <laughs> yeah, babe. No idea where they came. That's I know that song already though. That's not good. <laughs> I have to leave. <laughs> Here's the patience of the saints. Right. Some people don't turn off their cell phones during. <laughs> Some people actually really get mad at that. I don't know. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Here are. Shh. Everyone say. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from henceforth. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head, head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him, that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Mm. This is very key. Mm. This is very timeless. This is for us, too. This is for us, too. I was not raised on a farm. I understand, though, what you do with the sickle. And when harvest time comes, what do you do with the sickle? Cut it off. Cut stuff off. What do you do with it after? Pick it up and put it in a place. Or burn it. Some, some of it you store. Pick up, store, right? There's, there's people that wheat and chaff, this is good, this is not good. Some of it gets burned, some of it. What else happens with it? It gets crushed, it gets changed, it becomes something different, and people eat it. And it's generally healthy stuff, right? Unless people eat too much of it, then it's not. Or unless they get allergies. <laughs> the sickle is reaping who? Reaping what? This is a different kind of vegetation. It's, it's more animal than vegetable. This is people. The harvest of the earth is ripe. Do you know why? And do you know why it's always been right? Because people need to see hope. People need to hear that new song. People need to try to understand it. Your 
Your singing it can help them, and they can see it, and they'll need it. In following what God asked you to do, you play a part in saving a person's life. Maybe not their life here, but their life with the Lord everlasting afterward. After the death and destruction stuff, then the life. After the terrible nonsense, the good stuff. After learning how to crawl and bumping your knees and all that stuff, you walk. After taking the training wheels off of your bicycle and scraping your elbows and what, and Lord knows whatever, your forehead, and then you can ride okay. Then you can ride far, fast. After you learn the new song. Another angel, verse 17, came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden outside the city, and blood came out of the wine press, even unto the horse's bridles by the space of a thousand six hundred furlongs. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Talk about death and destruction. This is going to be amazing. And again, John is being told to write this stuff down. That he's seeing. That only through the power of the Holy Spirit is his brain able to be patched together while looking at this stuff. Verse 2 of chapter 15, I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. I don't know. I think that's a really cool picture. Mm -hmm. That's where I want to be. <laughs> I vote there. <laughs> what do I have to do to get to that point? I have to get pressed pretty good. I have to bleed. I have to hurt. I may have to die. I probably will die. No, I'm definitely going to die. This is after I'm dead. <laughs> I'm playing a harp on a sea of glass. And it's a new song. And it's loud. Very loud. And it's going to be great. That may, pick, may be a picture that doesn't jive for a number of folks. They want something else. We each have these little pictures of heaven in our heads. My picture of heaven has wooden floors with peanut shells on it and perfectly balanced pool tables. <laughs> That's me. Probably going to be nothing like that. It won't be anything like anything anybody ever saw before. That's where I want to be. I vote there. And in order to get there, I've got to kill myself any number of times a day. And it's going to hurt. And I'm going to get scraped knees and a scraped forehead. And I'm going to need the Lord to give me patience. And I'm going to have to not say to people, I'm done with you. I'm going to have to have have the patience to say, I love you anyhow. And I'm going to have to have the patience to say, I don't understand it myself, but I'm trying my best to learn. And I have to have the patience to say, i got to do better. Because we're not arrived yet. we got to do better. 
Heavenly Father, with this death and destruction, there is everlasting hope. This is the point, I honestly believe, of your book of Revelation. This is why you gave it to a man to write, to see these visions and be able to try and explain them. The A, B, and C of it is terrible. But the outcome is glorious. The ending is amazing. Just as those three days with your son. The step-by-step -step process was excruciating. Horrible. It ended in death. And then, the greatest hope in the universe was born on that third day, that Sunday morning after the destruction and after the death, that victory was given to those who would take it and learn it and sing it. As that angel who flies about with the everlasting gospel, help us sing this song. Help us do it. Help us do it by the way we act. Help us not be done with people. Help us not think so much of ourselves. Help us stop thinking we're all that cool. Help us understand we're not. Give us the patience to be better than we are. There are people that are drowning and dying out there and they need to hear this song. Help us sing it the way you want us to sing it. Bless each one here, Father. Bless with each one this coming week as they walk in your service, as they walk into this dark world and prepare to show a light to people that need to see it. Keep us healthy and strong and keep the sinuses as clear as you can possibly do. That would be a help. We thank you for all you give us. We thank you for all you are. We give you thanks, honor, and glory, and we do so in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Brother Corey and Brother Dave, could you please get the offerings? And Brother Corey, would you ask the...